Tonight I'm pleased to introduce Legacy Russell, an artist, an artist, writer, and cultural producer who was born and raised right here in New York City. She's the founding theorist and coiner of the term and theoretical formation glitch feminism, uh, which she characterizes as a cultural movement that has a goal of using the internet as a means of resisting the hegemony of the corporeal. Hegemony, meaning like a kind of um, system or regime of, of power and domination. The corporeal, meaning the body. So resisting the, the tyranny or the regime of the body. Um, this socio-technological construct of gender and sexuality uh, was coined by Legacy in 2013 as an item for the Society Pages, which is an interesting publication, not the Society Pages of uh, another publication, um, and was later expanded upon in a commission for Rhizome, which I hold in my hands, and you guys can easily find by Googling um, Glitch Feminism, and uh, is um, only about five pages long when you print it out. Feels a lot longer online. <laughs> Legacies, Legacies art practice honors the tradition of social pomp and circumstance within the histories of religious rite and liturgy. Through her work, she explores how notions such as worship have been informed, impacted, redressed, and manipulated by modern American culture. And within her work, she inquires, how does ritual manifest in spaces ordinarily designated as secular? I think we will find out. Legacy has worked at and produced programs for the Bruce High Quality Foundation, and that was the context in which Legacy and I first met in maybe, was it 2010, 2010, um, at one of their amazing chaotic exhibitions. She's worked uh, at and produced programs for Creative Time and the Brooklyn Museum, the Whitney Museum of American Art, and the Metropolitan Museum. She is now a senior editor at the London publication Berfois and visual art editor at Apogee Journal. And since 2011, she has worked as a contributing editor, editor of Bomb Magazine's online journal, Bomb Daily. Her work can be found in The White Review, in Rhizome, in Dis, The Society Pages, Guernica, and Berfois, among other publications. She holds a master's in visual culture from Goldsmiths University College of London sorry, Goldsmiths College of the University of London. And her first book, Glitch Feminism, is forthcoming from Verso. Please join me in welcoming Legacy Russell. Oh, 
like a mighty long time. Chibab, chibab, my baby, ooh. It seems like a mighty long time. Chibab, chibab, oh, my baby. Chibab, chibab, oh, my, my, baby. My, my, chibab, chibab, my, my baby. Chibab, chibab, my baby. Question, what is glitch feminism? It's a good question. So, glitch feminism is a creative and political exploration of how the internet as material can expand or glitch the construct of the binary body. It deploys the language of glitch in positing that an error within the flawed machine we operate within one that disproportionately enacts violence on historically othered bodies is not an error at all, but rather an integral systems correction to the mechanics of culture and society as we know it. This is the Glitch Feminism Manifesto. Sit down and shut the fuck up. We don't care about your fragility, your patriarchy, your privilege. One, glitch is cosmic. There are many ways that we can think about the body, this idea of the corporeal that has been expanded on so much across history. So for the purpose of today though, I'd love it if you guys remain present with me for just a moment and regardless of what comes to mind when you consider the word body, Consider that the body is an idea, an idea that is cosmic, and in being such is inconceivably vast. We quite literally have only begun to scratch the surface of what the body is, what it can do, and what its future looks like. Two, let's throw shade. So part of the definition or the archetype of the body as we know it, a social construct, a cultural tool, a political agent that I am drawing on when I think about glitch feminism is this notion of giving material form to something that is abstract. We use body to give material form to something that has no form, that is abstract and as such is inconceivably vast. As a glitch feminist, I want to make abstract again that which has been forced into an uncomfortable and ill-defined material. The process of becoming material is one that is so bound up within problematics. It surfaces a tension that exists when we ask, who is given material? And further, who defines this material? Who names it? Who gives it value and why? Three. So, what does it mean to ghost on the body? What is that asking of us? 
to end our relationship with this social practice of the body as we know it, to let go of the material, of the normative, normative gendered architecture of the body, to withdraw from it, and to manifest a new understanding of it that embraces the abstract as material itself. This means that we can disidentify, and by disidentifying, we can make up our own rules as we search to resolve and or reconcile the problem of the body. We want a new framework. We want new skin. Or glitch is error. Glitch feminism calls for this. It asks us to look at the deeply flawed society we are all currently implicated by, participating in, and to confront the violence this society has done to bodies who disidentify, to bodies who exist within the liminal and embrace the in-between as a core component of survival, of futurity. Glitch feminism calls for each of us here in this room and beyond to seek out opportunity to trigger errors within this flawed system. Glitch feminism embraces the causality of error and turns the gloomy implication of glitch on its ear by acknowledging that an error in a social system that has actually already been disturbed by economic, social, sexual, racial, and cultural stratification as well as the imperialist wrecking ball of globalization, processes that continue to enact violence on all bodies, may not in fact be an error at all, but rather a much needed erratum. The glitch is a correction to the machine, and in turn, a positive departure. Five, glitch and grips. The decoding of gender becomes as much about how it is constructed as whether it can or cannot be read. Glitched bodies, those blurry bodies that aim to exist in a space in between, are encrypted. Existing in between, they push back against algorithm built for and by a white, straight, normative mainstream. Glitched bodies pose a threat to social order. They cannot be programmed. Judith Butler observes in her excitable speech, A Politics of the Performative, one exists not only by virtue of being recognized, but by being recognizable. Let us make space as glitch feminists for ourselves by broadening the realm of the unrecognizable, and let glitch be deployed as something other than enemy, a political agent that adroitly threatens the capital of consumption, aimed at infiltrating and complicating systems, testing boundaries, traveling along limits, and defying limits. Six. Glitch is antibody. Artist Lynn Hirschman Leeson's Antibody surfaced in her essay Romancing the Antibody, Lust and Longing in Cyberspace, lays useful groundwork for applying the language of mechanical glitch as a mode of resistance against body binary. Like computer viruses, Hirschman Leeson writes, antibodies escape extinction through their ability to morph and survive. They exist in perpetual motion navigating parallel conditions of time and memory. Intersectional with these antibodies, the glitch body answers to world conditions in its aim to transform the socioeconomic machine of gender. Thus, the glitch and the bodies that claim it can be both subversive tool and radical technology in and of themselves. Seven, glitch refuses. While the hashtag of glitch feminism has definitely taken a life of its own in the form of ever-expanding digital archive, glitch bodies themselves refuse order. They wander within a wildness of unrecognizable being, actively reimagining and recentering neoteric realities. Glitch bodies hack gender. They vivify and live on via the material of the internet. Thus, these bodies, always online, remain current in their presence and, as such, are not placed within the quiet annals of history. They stretch beyond an archival construct as yoked to or embedded within a specific moment in time. The mythologies as driven by narrative history, of course, only surface in 2020 perspective that comes with the privileges of hindsight. It is the archiving of material that allows for those perspectives to deepen as time passes. The architecture of the archive rises out of the ordering of data material into categories, often building towards some sort of narrative arc. 
by reviewing pieces in material order, sense can be made lending towards an integrated understanding. The data of such a program, society, processed. Counter to this, the glitch body remains contemporary, insists on rejecting historical processing, and celebrates its disorder as a mark of success within a social system that strangles with the fetishism of categorization. In turn, glitch feminism ever operates as a living network, its data celebrated in its refusal of linearity. Hey, glitch is remix. Glitch feminism calls for a breaking from the hegemony of a structured system infused with the pomp and circumstance of patriarchy, one that for too long has marginalized bodies and within this done violence to female identified bodies in particular, continuing to offend our sensibilities by giving us only a piece of the pie and assuming our satisfaction. As glitch feminists, we want to claim for ourselves permanent seats at the table an empowered means of demarcating space that can be possessed by us in entirety, a veritable room of our own that, despite the strides made by a feminist political action, has yet to fully belong to us. Except we don't want just a room, we want the world. Glitch feminism looks to the digital as a means of building these worlds. It underscores that the binary code of male-female and the code of real life, as posited by the language of IRL, pitted against the lives we lead online, somehow taken as less real, as being too rigid, not allowing for that slip and slide that is the reality of how gender, sexuality, and the cosmic bodies they occupy exist today, have existed yesterday, and will continue to evolve, survive, and stay alive. Nine, glitch mobilizes. The cells we occupy online, at night, on the internet, they're important, they're beautiful, and they're meaningful. We have to continue to experiment, bloom, and build. Artists play a key role in this experimentation, acting as an important bridge between what happens online and what happens AFK, away from keyboard, and strengthening the loop there. The internet is not a fantasy space. It is a future space a place where glitch feminists can imagine and mobilize as an activist tool to point toward a futurity that, though still buffering, is en route to being realized. 10. Glitch is in. Artists such as E. Jane, Manuel Arturo Abreu, Shawnee McElaine Holloway are doing essential work as creative architects, finding ways to stretch the idea of the body to its limits, to return it to the immaterial, to celebrate its abstraction as a political tool. The poet and activist Essex Hemphill wrote in a 1995 essay about cyberspace saying, I stand at the threshold of cyberspace and wonder, is it possible that I am unwelcome here too? Will I be allowed to construct a virtual reality that empowers me? Can invisible men see their own reflections? You know that feeling when you go into the club and start shaking your ass? Like people start Hi, my name is Manuel Arturo Abreu. I am the one who produced the book. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about the private section for me at Facebook.com. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to welcome you to my garage. These artists create new constructs of the corporeal online, and in doing so, empower themselves, empower others in bringing cosmic bodies offline out into the world. Through their respective practices, we can see the plausibility of quite literally becoming one's avatar. The selves we play at and perform on, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, these are blueprints for new bodies, cosmic in their capacity, vast in their virtuality, but also very real. 11. Glitch slips. Glitch is conjectured as finding its etymological roots in the Yiddish glitch, meaning slippery, or perhaps German glitchen, to slip, to slide. It is this slip and slide that the glitch makes plausible, a swim in the liminal, a transformation across selfdoms. 
12, glitch and virus. How can we expire the binary body and the world that governs it? What can be done to redistribute male and female, and in turn masculine and feminine, across an ecstatic spectrum? Butler melancholically points out that the positions of masculine and feminine are established in part through prohibitions which demand the loss of certain sexual attachments, and demand as well that those losses not be avowed and not grieved. As glitch feminists, we claim the right to grieve as part of the process of the trauma of gender. As part of this mor morning, we actively refuse a history of prohibitions, creating pathways where previously they might not have been possible. As we aim to hack gender, we also re-examine the snap redistribution of power as a too simplistic tool toward achieving equality. Surely this act in itself presents an obvious paradox. Resituating power between two gendered points is inherently gendered. Assuming power is not a straightforward task of taking power from one place, transferring it intact, and then and there making it one's own, the act of appropriation may involve an alteration of power such that the power assumed or appropriated works against the power that made that assumption possible. Such an act does not automatically give rise to the empowerment of agents therein. Performed within an ongoing system failure, this act cannot guarantee us freedom of new directions, nor provide new definitions. Gender is a replicating virus in the social machine. And as fire fights fire, so does the error of glitch as it goes up against this virus, a virus in its own right, finding victory in new configurations. 13. Glitch survives. The glitch body, lambently ineffable, disrupts. It is a gerund act. It is an action ongoing, an activism that unfolds without end. In order to speak to the rebellious transformations of this embodied self, we also must explore the way these glitch selves regenerate and how they might work against a historical discourse about the body that bends to a heteronormative narrative in its glorification of an origin story. We are suspicious of the reproductive matrix, yet acknowledge as well that every technology is a reproductive technology. As such, these technologies have the capacity to regenerate positively. With the reproduction applied within a political sphere as a means of protecting the binary of man-woman and the ability to reproduce having an oppressive legacy of lending social and economic value to biological female bodies, the coercive architecture of reproduction cannot be overlooked here. Though the online space and the work artists are doing within it is indeed generative in the production of new frameworks, how this regeneration operates within this discussion cannot be left within the power of the straight mind or thought of domination. To work against this as hazard, a creative vanguard plays a vital role. Artists using the digital as a means of talking back to power structures and identifying systems that promulgate the potential for raising a new world order, one that mirrors ongoing AFK problematics through the reification of race, class, and gender thereby puncturing the wasted myth that the digital is anything near utopic. 14. Glitch is liquid. Simone de Beauvoir is famous for positing, one is not born, but rather becomes a woman. The glitch posits, one is not born, but rather becomes a body. The digital is a vessel through which our becoming realizes itself. So get glitched, become your avatar, and stay cosmic. Do you people dress like this during the day, or is it strictly just at night? You're born naked and the rest is drag, you know?
guys in the three-piece suits over there. I look terrible in a three-piece suit, but it's right. I mean, everything you wear, this this body you have is a vessel. Et voilà comment environ 150 images plus loin, une autre jeune femme, sa semblable, sa sœur, qui est le même objet. Où est donc la vérité de face ou de profil Et d'abord, un objet, qu'est-ce que c'est <laughs> so what is your day like? My day like, usually I go to sleep at like um, 7 in the morning. My day starts in the evening, so I have time enough to get something to eat, uh, go and um, take a shower, shave my whole body. <laughs> and then I um, turn to go out and have a, have a home cocktail, then throw my makeup and then go back out again. Peut-être qu'un objet est ce qui permet de relier, de passer d'un sujet à l'autre, donc de vivre en société, d'être ensemble. Mais alors, puisque la relation sociale est toujours en vie, puisque ma pensée est divise autant qu'elle unit, puisque ma parole rapproche quand il crie les primes, et il seule par sa qualité, puisque qu'un immense fossé sépare la certitude subjective que j'ai de moi-même et la vérité objective que je suis pour les autres, puisque je n'arrête pas de me trouver coupable alors que je me sens innocent, puisque chaque événement transforme ma vie quotidienne, puisque j'échoue sans cesse à communiquer, je veux dire à comprendre, à aimer, à me faire aimer, et que chaque échec me fait éprouver ma solitude, puisque... Just wondering for the people who don't make money um, promoting parties, um, if you got kicked out of your parents' house, what would you do? Now, Michael, what would you do? Guess you gotta find someone who's gonna pay your way. Puisque je ne peux pas m'arracher à l'objectivité qui m'écrase, ni à la subjectivité qui m'exile, puisqu'il ne m'est pas permis ni de m'élever jusqu'à l'être, ni de tomber dans le néant, il faut que j'écoute, il faut que je regarde autour de moi plus que jamais, le monde, mon semblable, mon frère. Now, I mentioned and we have uh, alluded to the drug ecstasy. I want to talk a whole lot about, you don't have to tell your personal story if you don't feel like it, but is it a fact that you gave the drug to your mother, Michael? <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> that wasn't me. Oh, right. <laughs> it might have been. I, I forget a lot. I forget a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Two things that come to my mind um, in thinking about glitch feminism are the discourses of cyber feminism on the one hand and Afrofuturism on the other. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you might be able to do some triangulation. Happy to. Um, well, I mean, as just an initial point, cyber feminism is, uh, you know, a root for glitch feminism. So, you know, thinking of the cyborg as a metaphor, but also as kind of a tool within talking about body politic is something that's been really influential to me. Um, the intersection of cyber feminism, um, you know, and Afrofuturism, I would say is something that I've done a lot of work on. Um, most recently, I had curated an exhibition um, in this past year um, that was called Wandering Wilding, Blackness on the Internet, um, which looked at specifically how there are intersections between um, you know, uh, different representations of blackness um, and race, um, and artists who have used Afrofuturism, but also cyberfeminism as um, primary components of their own practice. So these are artists like Tabitha Razar, um, Niva Costa, Fanny Sosa, um, Hannah Black, um, Evan Ifakoya, 
Um, so, and E. Jane actually as well, who you saw in the presentation. Um, so, you know, thinking about like what that means to me, I think Afrofuturism has been meaningful because it's allowed me to think about looking forward and imagining using the kind of a tool of imagination as a political um, mobile object. Um, so, for example, with Octavia Butler, um, a lot of the work that Octavia Butler produced was very much so thinking about through the lens of Afrofuturism, like how can we kind of imagine not only um, you know, sort of scientific uh, spaces and landscapes that can be mobilized in a political sphere, but also how those things can um, allow us to perhaps um, manifest new identities and consider the body as um, an extension of the virtual. Um, so. I would say that like that loop when we're talking about kind of the um, AFK space, which is away from keyboard and as well the online space and the importance of kind of traveling away from the screen um, out into the world at large, what that means. I would say that the, the digital space for me is a space that is Afrofuturist and of course is so infused with histories of cyber feminism and glitch feminism definitely follows in suit. It looks at um, the digital space and the online space as a place to kind of um, do uh, uh, you know, kind of to play, to experiment, um, but also to um, mobilize and to activate um, as one kind of steps out into the world at large and um, congregates and collectivizes with allies. Follow up while I've got the mic. Sure. Um, I'm curious about your own practice, your, um, the kind of what you just did, which was a performance of a manifesto. Mm -hmm with speech and interesting use of the projector um, and the speakers, and your decision to, f to frame this project as a manifesto. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I would say like there's been a lot of conversation about that um, since I originally wrote the essay. Um, and you know, in early stages of, of writing it and then also of having it published, um, people would you know, write me and say, well, why aren't there steps to this manifesto? Um, that was an ongoing discussion. And I had made the decision actually to have it be called a manifesto as kind of a call to action as a political and social framework. Um, but to not have it be necessarily something that's stepped towards a cause of sorts um, or towards a condition. Um, for me at the time, it felt like that the numbering um, indicated or suggested a kind of final point of arrival, and I wanted there to be some greater continuity within that. Um, so, you know, here you're seeing that there are numbers. This is kind of an evolution of years of talking about it and thinking about it. and. Um, I do feel like that, you know, at this stage, these numbers could kind of go on forever. There are a lot of things that can be materialized or imagined through the metaphor or vehicle of the glitch, um, but this is just 14 of them. Assuming uh, complete transubstati transubstantiation of the self as glitch, which I, <clears throat> which I would say is like a lingual transubstantiation into language, uh, how can we agree upon meaning with others, both like and unlike us, and then return that meaning to sense, which I think is like a corporeal function? I think that um, it's a really good question. It's a really complicated one, and so I'm going to try my best to answer it as clearly as I can without going on kind of a weird rant. Um, but I would say, like, that in the video, that it's an artwork that I showed at the last um, slide, um, there's a part of that which is taken from a Godard film called Two or Three Things I Know About Her, and it's an um, interior monologue where the, the um, kind of narrator is reflecting about this link or gap between um, speech and action, but also noting that actually when we put things to speech, when we kind of use language, we're not only applying a violence to the body and to the world around us, but we're also um, limiting its capacity. Um, so for me, I think like that link is actually really meaningful in this context. Um, I think language fails and is actually something that um, <laughs> is problematic in itself. The fact that I'm sitting here and using language to talk about these things is um, very challenging, right? Because uh, there are so many points here that actually limit access. The second that I start talking, the second that people try to kind of talk about identity um, and selfdom and bodies um, and describe experiences um, that are sort of sensory through that, 
um, to one another. So um, you know, I think it's complicated, and so this is why I actually think that digital space um, is a really amazing tool, um, and not to kind of essentialize it in a way that um, romanticizes the internet in a kind of 1990s sense. But um, you know, obviously, as we continue to use it, I feel like that you know, artists who are, of course, applying their practice specifically within you know the platforms of Instagram and Twitter and even Facebook, which you know, as we know, is a very problematic institution of its own right, um, you know, are using the visual image as it's paired with language in a way that kind of breaks it up and it as well um, pushes back, I would say, against this kind of overall coding that we are all conditioned within um, that assumes that language is enough. Um, so, you know, as artists, I, I do I think that you know we struggle sometimes to figure out. Um, whether you know we should be integrating language or whether the actual image can speak for itself, these are ongoing discussions. Um, but I would say that you know a work of art, um, you know, is is the internet, um, and that you know this as a material allows us to kind of extend in that way and and to provide something that perhaps language limits otherwise. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm curious just about say cultural shifts when you're dealing maybe not so much in theory but about. African Caribbean reception in London mm. versus what you would find in New York yeah. or that sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, I would say I just moved back from London and so I'm still kind of unpacking aspects of that experience. Um, but with the kind of short sight that I have having just, you know, arrived of sorts. Um, being back in New York has been a real welcome change for a lot of reasons. Um, I think for any person who has spent time in, in the UK, right, the, it, it's a very interesting space because I would say language in itself and how it operates is very different um, and what that conditioning is as its history, um, you know, how it kind of um, links back to a kind of imperialist <laughs> um, practice of sorts too with the monarchy that's still in place. Um, there are a lot of things that are wrapped up within that that are really challenging and I think do of course um, challenge or complicate sometimes um, what diaspora means in, in those spaces. Um, you know, as a black woman in the UK, I felt um, I felt really uh, challenged by that, I, for lack of a better term. I, I think um, it was really interesting to see that actually kind of the um, cultural identity theory, um, that discourse as a language that we spend a lot of time um, as a foundational practice within our studies here in many spaces, um, actually um, is not always brought into um, the institution and the academy. And so I often found myself in really strange and alienating situations where I was getting into arguments and conflicts with people um, simply because they kind of were trying to pretend like cultural theory and humanities like doesn't exist or is not important and that theory can exist in a vacuum. Um, and this is often coming from kind of white academics in that space. Um, you know, I also, as a kind of um, counterpoint to that, I felt like that um, it allowed me to deepen in my own queer identity um, being abroad because I think that the UK and London in particular, um, but also Manchester and Liverpool and, um, you know, I, I would say um, has quite a ripe history of um, queer culture and, and how that manifests itself is something that um, is very deeply integrated into talking about blackness too and the diaspora. So I think that that intersection for me was really important um, and kind of um, helped to sustain me while I was there. Because the internet is going to be, is beginning to change in the way that it's um, basically being bought by corporates, corporations, and they're probably gonna change the structure of how, the fact that it really won't be free anymore, right? right? How do you believe that that's gonna play into this theory of uh, glitch feminism? Um, I think it's a great question. And um, I mean, the internet is increasingly being privatized, but it's also kind of not a surprise because it was originally invented as a private space. So. Um, you know, its roots in the military and how it's kind of been democratized and then romanticized as being this democratic space, which we now know is definitely not true. Like, I don't think it was ever true, but we can certainly um, confirm that now with all the things that we're kind of seeing and reading around the world. Um, I think there's like a lot of questions about how we can use this material or if we should maybe delete ourselves from the material altogether. 
Um, you know, as I've chatted with people who are peers and colleagues, people I respect a lot over these even just past couple months, it's been interesting to kind of see where um, we polarize in terms of people being like, I'm erasing, insert app here, I'm erasing Facebook, I'm erasing Uber, like as a means of activism. Um, I think that as a strand in itself is deeply problematic because um, never in history has there ever been a positive activist movement which requires or you know has had people basically just um, delete themselves like race. Um, I think in this case, um, for people to be making that step back and saying that that's somehow progressive, from my perspective, is, is tricky and complicated, although it's something that's going to continue to kind of unwind and show itself, and maybe um, within that there is some, some hope or strategy. Um, but I, I do feel actually that staying present in these spaces and kind of um, figuring out ways to um, intervene or to insert ourselves as interventions within these platforms is meaningful, um, especially given the fact that, you know, majority of the content, of course, that's being produced on the internet is not by artists exclusively, right? There are many different people who are driving these engines. Um, and so I feel like that, you know, when we delete ourselves or when we step back from these platforms, it, you know, creates a problem because we are feeding into the very sort of blank space and lack of diverse opinion and politic that um, is the root problem in the first place. So I would say within this kind of increased privatization, um, you know, it mirrors the world that we're existing in. It's basically just holding a mirror up to the fact that everything is essentially being bought and sold. Um, and so I think it can break the, the notion or our kind of utopic hope that perhaps the internet is the thing that can resolve us. Um, but, you know, I actually do feel like that the, um, the notion of kind of alone together, which was something that Sherry Turkle, um, you know, wrote about, which was ironic because Sherry Turkle as a theorist originally started off as one of the biggest champions of the internet as a collective space. Um, is actually something that more and more is showing itself as being incredibly problematic, of course, because um, it's still, the online space is a space where people um, are able to kind of meet and intersect in ways, even though surveyed, um, that actually otherwise might cause, be a kind of root of violence to them if we are meeting out in the street. Um, so it's a really important tool, and I think even in its privatization, just as we have out in the world around us in its privatization, um, aspects of it will continue to show themselves to be problematic, but I don't think that means that we should be turning ourselves away from it. Um, where, where do you set up your interventions? So when I'm talking about interventions, um, I mean, as, as an idea, I'm talking about artists and creating material on the internet as a point blank. So when you're talking about my intervention, I would say this right here is one of many. Um, I go around the world and I talk a lot about gender and gender theory, I, you know, teaching classes and talking to people about why it's important to be um, examining these systems critically. So for me, that's the intervention that I carry, but um, you know, I would say that looking at the artists, for example, who are you know, in the presentation, and there are many, many more, of course, who are using um, digital material um, or the realm of the virtual as a primary jumping off point, that they in themselves are interventions and the work that they're producing is incredibly important politically um, and creatively. Can you give us uh, an online location uh, apart from Rhizome? An online location for what? Never mind, it's fine. It's fine. And I'd love to know, what do you, like, are you www.intervention.com? Give us a starting point. Say again? Give us a starting point. A starting point, I mean, in terms of a place to go, to yes. read, or what would you like to, to do? To go, to read, to peruse, to uh, I discuss. I mean, Rhizome is an incredible resource, but I would say the society pages are as well. Um, you know, for me, I, you know, I actually am oftentimes looking at um, different people's Instagram profiles, so I'm happy to give you like a full reading list of Instagram profiles because um, there's a lot of really amazing content being produced there, of course. Thanks. Uh, I have been thinking about death on the internet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if like it exists or like how you can define like. When you say die. death on the internet, do you mean like literally killing off one's online persona, or do you mean like how we process death online? Like you, you can't really delete yourself from online space. I feel like even if you like I don't know literally delete your account from Instagram or something, but you know, maybe somebody took your like a uh, account of screenshots or whatever. So you can't mm. really, you know, just 
get out of from online i feel but like if death exists on the internet like how do you define like to die on the internet like i don't, I don't know. know i mean i guess <laughs> First of all, you can delete yourself from the internet, yeah. so that it is possible people have done it. Um, it's possible to erase your digital footprint, so for the record, for anyone who wants to know how to do that, you actually can Google it. Um, but, um, so, but that's one thing. The other thing is, is that um, you, I mean, thinking about death bring up a good point. Um, for me, I've written about death as in what happens when people die and their digital footprints as they are left behind. And that essays I've written about that are available online. Um, but I kind of, I feel like that for me, I have, um, and perhaps this is informed by you know, my own losses in my life, um, I've found it actually really comforting at certain points to be able to return to certain digital footprints um, in those moments of loss. I think that people have really varying opinions about that and what that might mean. Um, there also are like quite literally, you know, apps that aim to replicate, you know, literally replica, um, apps that, you know, kind of aim to replicate uh, relationships and then with, through that you can kind of um, identify um, moments to end that relationship and in that way kind of um, uh, embrace a metaphorical death, um, or, you know, of this avatar that you've created. Um, I do think that, you know, within death on the internet, that this is something that's still unfolding. I personally find it to be um, incredibly amazing to be able to find people's digital footprints. Um, you know, Mark Aguilar, for example, who, um, whose work was one of the first slides, the um, one through seven, um, these are the axes, it was an amazing uh, trans artist and poet, um, and that work remains online because of digital footprint, not because it was formally archived in any way. Um, so being able to go back and look at that and be able to participate in that as part of a really important um, art historical discourse is where the archive and its non-linearity, right, where there's not a finite point, um, actually becomes really useful. So I do think in the case of like art history and how things are archived, but also in terms of current events, being able to look at someone's Twitter profile and you know, look at someone's Instagram and celebrate their life and their contributions, I actually find to be really important and will be increasingly so. Hi, uh, could you talk about the relation bet uh, between your manifesto and uh, popular culture uh, and the references that you use that you used in the presentation yeah um i mean popular culture at, at large like what part of popular culture uh, yeah i know that it's like a very vague way of calling it but i saw a lot of images from movies or music videos yeah and i would like to know how do you think this relation yeah so i mean i asked many people that i absolutely adore and enjoy um, for reference points in terms of thinking about cybernetics or the robot or avatars um, to give me suggestions about things that have been meaningful to them as cultural reference points. Um, the reason I did that is because I actually do think as sources to cite, these are the things that we think about still when we think about the avatar, we think about digital space, somehow it still exists in this like very 1.0, actually very physical space that we can get into and go and there are spaceships and there's you know, masks and there's robots and um, that's like kind of Blade Runner <laughs> version of self is something I think has been imagined as a key point of science fiction forever. Um, and that is a fantasy, of course, that uh, continues to kind of unfold as we see that technology is advancing in, in many different directions. But I used it specifically here because I think it's useful for us to be grounding ourselves within this space that is physical in this room where we're sitting um, and have as a point of contrast these different cultural sites and sources that um, remain really active in our imagination. Um, within the context of glitch feminism and talking about you know, how we can kind of um, digest popular culture and, and look at as aspects or opportunities of like glitch fe feminist theory and how it can enact itself out in the world. I would say like a really good example would be that you know, on a regular basis, um, for example, with the Google Art and Culture app that came out 
Um, you know, there were all of these think pieces like real deep <laughs> where people were like, we're upset because, you know, art history is not bending to us in this way and like that these images are not reflecting us accurately. Um, when in reality, I kind of thought that there was an opportunity there because, you know, art history is, uh, you know, one that has been historically written by, um, you know, white men and that is a, a sort of narrative that is very particular and so it's not surprising that also within tech, which um, has a dominant presence of white men, um, that this app coming out of Google would reflect that as like a perfect intersection, right? So for myself as a black woman, as a queer woman, like to not see myself in that app um, is not surprising and I was kind of like intrigued by how many people were so outraged because for me it felt like saying like art history is not reflecting us, which is real, but then the question is what comes next? So what, what do we do about that? Um, and so within Glitch Feminism in particular, I think you know, a lot of the writing that I've been doing is um, brainstorming about how to kind of work against that and it's not, as I said, about deleting yourself but rather about actually inserting as much of yourself out into the world as you possibly can. Um, because we are actually um, invisible, my selfdom is not really visible, it's not read by these apps, my, this technology is not being made for me. Um, my body actually is a body that it doesn't understand. Um, that's something that I think can be a really useful tool. Um, and it's something that I feel like that, you know, is more productive for us to be thinking about that space where we can travel through that and um, activate through that and um, innovate too in building our own technologies um, rather than sitting back and asking for institutions that have historically ignored us and erased us um, to acknowledge us because, you know, that's something that um, as a reparation is absolutely due, but it's not going to happen tomorrow. And I think within that, we have an opportunity and agency to act against that. Um, <clears throat> do you have a particular audience in mind? And um, do you have also a kind of, because your manifesto is um, challenging, and do you have um, a sort of call to action that appeals to the broad audience that is the internet in that sense? I mean, in short, I don't have a specific audience in mind. Um, I didn't write this for a single person um, or set of people. Um, I started writing it for myself um, because it was the text that I felt I urgently needed and um, it was a call to action that was um, honest in terms of um, something that I wanted to hold myself accountable to. Um, that was years ago and I'm standing here and I'm talking about it with you. Um, since then I've had literally hundreds upon hundreds of conversations with people who actually have kind of blown my mind because um, they've brought to the table like identities and ideas that are, are totally um, beyond what my original research was based in. Um, so for me, I actually find that to be a really exciting thing because that inspiration actually starts with you and you know what you are delivering and, and what you're willing to bring to the table and to think about as it intersects with this idea or the vehicle of glitching, um, which of course has its own history. Um, so, you know, I, I am res reticent to apply a, um, a kind of draw a line around it and to kind of, uh, uh, you know, inform it with an identity because I actually don't think that that would be suitable in this conversation. I think it's something that belongs to everyone. Uh, I know it is pretty old school question, but I'm curious about your idea or experience of, of uh, solidarity in t within diverse subjectivist, subjectivities in digital space. Um, so just to be clear, I'm understanding your question. Just solidarity, like just like collect people and mm -hmm. just act together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like, so how does that apply? Or? You're like, yeah, how kind of your experience or your idea of how we how people can like work together and just move act together yeah like, I think it's a great question um, and it's actually an awesome one to kind of land on here um, for me I would say like a lot of the solidarity is common people um, you know entering and exiting the talks that I've given and the conversations that I've had both in a formal and informal sense an academic and you know not and also a space that is tied to contemporary art, but also one that is not. Um, and this is not a conversation that is exclusive to contemporary art, even though we are sitting in an art school right now. Um, 
So I think it's about re-examining language, and there's a solidarity in that. Obviously, there's a lot of physicality of, of you know, going to a march and meeting in person um, and informing oneself via you know, amazing reading groups that I've seen people um, start up and participate in, or I was just seeing in the elevator um, a field trip that SVA students took to a feminist scene fair. Um, you know, these are things that are in, in themselves part of an activism and a solidarity, but I think that the language itself that we use is the thing that um, is due most examination. Legacy, thank you. Thank you.